I was getting this question in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, and uh, I said that the West really doesn't understand militant Islam. So I wrote a book in 1995, and I said that if, it, if the West doesn't wake up to the suicidal nature of militant Islam, the next thing you'll see uh, is uh, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. The, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. Didn't have any markings on it that I saw. No, no I didn't see any. The second one, I didn't have you know, like no camouflage or anything. You know, no, no emblems, no logos. I mean, it, it was moving so unbelievably fast. The last thing I saw before the second attack was the silver underside of the plane before it went into the building. Were you close enough to be able to see any markings on, on the airplane? Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the side. No, it was a black plane. It looked like a fighter jet. It, it looked like a fighter jet. It was a military plane. And it didn't look like a commercial jet. Could, could be a drone aircraft. That's an aircraft that's a... a guided electronically uh, to its target without having a pilot. Did you actually see the jet itself? Yeah. And what type was it? it? It was gray, to be honest with you. It was gray. It was about a, it was like a 737. I thought it was a fighter jet coming in to cover the city. We've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted, whether in fact there wasn't something else at the base of the towers. In the lobby of the zoo, a bomb had exploded there. Was, uh, four, uh, all the glass was taken out. There were 10 foot by 10 foot uh, marble panels that were once walls. Uh, several people with their hair singed, uh, skin hanging off. And at that time, we heard a huge explosion. I actually, what I feared, I never in a million years feared those buildings coming down. Never. I did fear a secondary explosion or possibly a second plane. 30th floor. We hear another explosion. I really thought it was maybe the end of the world. There was going to be more planes coming in. There was going to be bombs going off. I didn't know, uh, you know, to what degree they really just had us surrounded. Uh, the World Trade Center, we took uh, a hit on that last explosion. The man supposed to be evacuated at this time. He's dead. It exploded. It all just blew us all in. The fire department's happened? All okay. back. There's no pulse or nothing. This, the third explosion, the whole lobby collapsed on us. What was it like? What was it like? Horrible. It's like Horrible. hell. You don't the want to know. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Is that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. That was so the planet travel? Yeah, definitely a secondary explosion. Because we was inside waiting to go upstairs. And on the way upstairs, the whole fucking plane blew. And we just, we just collapsed on everybody inside the lobby. Similar to the first tower coming down, secondary? I don't know about the first one, but I know the second one. Was, it was terrible. Then there was a third one, too, after that one. You're in the building trying to help people, and it's exploding on the inside the building. So I don't think we're getting any worse than this. Big boom, come down the steps, everything fine till we got to the basement and then everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped in there with another guy, crawled out, kept getting hit in the head, kept bags sold around, finally we clawed our way out over the rubble. Yeah. Come on, Tom. did all right. All right, where be, Tom? Thank you. 
This was clearly the, the, the way the structure is collapsing. This was the result of something that was planned. This is not, it's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. They're thinking about bringing the building down. They didn't say what building, they just said bringing a building down. Last few seconds, he took his hand off and you heard three, two, one, and he was just saying, just run for your life, just run for your life. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like boom. Oh, you, you want to call your mother or something? You gotta get back. You gotta get back. All right. Don't worry about me. This was boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. He said after the recent attacks which the U.S. has witnessed, the U.S. government ventured to point fingers at me, accused me of involvement. The U.S. government has consistently blamed me for being behind every occasion its enemies attack it. I would like to assure the world that I did not plan the recent attacks, which seems to have been planned by people for personal reasons. The president said that Osama bin Laden was the prime suspect. Why? There's uh, just a lot of evidence. Oh, the reason I keep insisting that uh there was a relationship between Iraq and Saddam and Al-Qaeda because there was a relationship. Two-thirds of Americans say it's not worth fighting. So? So? Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. If they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching right. it and running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was if if it had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. If they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. All of a sudden, it was like bang, 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 like bullet shots. I saw from the corner, boom, 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 boom. Just like 20 straight hits, just went down. And as the bombs were gone, people just started running and I sat there and watched a few of them explode and then I just turned around and I just started running for my life because at that point, the World Trade Center was coming right down. From the corner, boom, 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 boom. The whole building just went, and as the bombs were gone, people just started running, and I sat there and watched a, a few of them explode. way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives, in other words, controlled demolition. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off when you see the old demolitions of these old buildings. It looks like one of those scenes of an old building being, you know, purposely dynamited and blown up. It didn't fall over. Uh -huh. It looked as if somebody put TNT all throughout that building. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. This was clearly, the, the, the way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. This is not, it's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. The tower would not have collapsed absent some tremendous it, trauma. Absolutely. I am reasonably sure that it was not the impact of the plane, the one that did this. Something, something the ignited there, though. That, maybe they had, that, that was an incredible... That was an incredible explosion. Uh, and that does not cause from a... I, I agree with you. It could have been something that was planted. Or, or a bomb planted yeah. in the building, yeah. Okay, the second tower has gone down. Oh my god! That was a bomb that did that. Oh 
The top section pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. Something of this kind is what we should have seen when the top section of the towers collapsed onto the lower one. The upper and lower sections should have mutually destroyed each other until all the energy is dissipated and the system comes to a rest. What could not have happened is this. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. This is such a simple, fundamental concept that architects and engineers were astonished in seeing it totally ignored by NIST. This is high school physics, and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. It's just ma'am after that? No, just ma'am, everybody tried to make their way out. Just trying to help all the brothers get out. A lot of people, lot of people trapped inside. I was sitting in the Brooklyn Navy on the course of Brooklyn. We watched the first explosion as we were watching the building. So a black, very large airplane fly right into the second building. It came out of the south, right, right in front of our eyes. Just it, it was so surreal, like a movie set. Second, second, and third explosions also. Right? We were in the building for the third one. It collapsed. It was on this drive here for the other one. People that understand, there may be more. Any one of these fucking buildings could blow up. This ain't done yet. Number seven, World Trade Center. We've heard several reports from several different officers now that that is the building that is going to go down next. In fact, one officer told me they're just waiting for that to come down at this point. If you're in that building, it's coming down. Don't bring it. Watch it blow up. Move it back. All right, guys. And it would sound like a countdown. And at the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one, and he was just saying, just run for your life, just run for your life. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like ba boom. And it's like a distinct sound. This was ba boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Three years later, Silverstein issued a statement claiming that he had used the term pull it to refer to pulling the firefighters out of Building 7. But there are several problems with Silverstein's explanation. According to FEMA's building performance study, firefighters were never in the building. Preliminary indications were that due to lack of water, no manual firefighting actions were taken by the fire department. And these statements, from Popular Mechanics and the New York Times, confirmed that no firefighting took place in Building 7, and that the fire department had ordered firefighters away from the building at 11.30 am. Another problem is that Silverstein made no reference to the firefighters when he talked about Building 7 for the PBS documentary. Plus, after Silverstein stated that the decision was made to pull Building 7, he finished his sentence with these words. And then we watched the building collapse. This would indicate that the collapse of Building 7 was the direct result of the decision to pull it. As a successful property developer, Silverstein would have gained considerable experience in hiring contractors to carry out controlled demolition of buildings. It's reasonable to assume that he would be aware that the term pull is often used by demolition experts to refer to bringing a building Where down. Where were you on September 11th? Um, you know, uh, I was 
home. Um, and I, the only reason I wasn't where I was every morning, uh, subsequent to the 26th day of July, um, I was, my, my mornings were spent uh, usually at a breakfast meeting at Windows, an 8 o'clock breakfast meeting, Windows at the top of it. Right? And then going down to visit with my tenants, my new tenants uh, at the trade center, getting to know them, understanding their problems and so forth, ascertaining how we could, how we could service their needs better. Um, and uh, which is the first, first, one of the first things you do when you acquire a property. You begin to meet your, pe meet your tenants and start talking with them. Uh, and so my mornings were spent at the Trade Center, and then by noon I was back uptown. And, uh, uh, and so that particular morning, uh, because I have light colored hair and fair skin, and uh, I'm a annuity to the dermatologist, mm -hmm. uh, my wife, God bless her, had made an appointment for me uh, at the doctor. And I remember dressing to go to the doctor. I finally saying to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I've got so much to do downtown. I've got to cancel this. I've got to go downtown. And she said, you're not going to cancel this appointment. You're going to the dermatologist. And, you know, having been married now for, to the same woman for 46 years, you, you get this sense of determination on occasion, their voices. And I said, okay, okay, yes, dear, I'll go. I'll go. And then just minutes later, I uh, received a telephone call to turn on a television set and witnessed this horrendous circumstance. Uh, the first plane hitting, and then the second plane hitting, of course, with the second hit. Uh, it became obvious that this was terrorism. Disaster wrecking crew, talking about preparing to demolish Building 6. Hello? Oh, we're getting ready to pull Building 6. When referring to Building 7, it was Silverstein who suggested that the smartest thing to do was to pull it. I said, you know, we've had such a terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. And because Silverstein has more knowledge of controlled demolition than he does of firefighting, it is reasonable to assume that he was referring to pulling the building down. In an article titled Shame on Jesse Ventura, Fox News journalist Jeffrey Shapiro confirms that Larry Silverstein had controlled demolition on his mind on September the 11th. And it was no secret to police and others on the ground that day. Shapiro stated that on September the 11th, Larry Silverstein was on the phone to his insurance carrier to see if they would authorize the controlled demolition of Building 7. This revelation causes yet another problem for the official story. How could Silverstein expect to carry out a controlled demolition when it takes several weeks to prepare a 47-story building for demolition? Larry Silverstein Not only did he avoid being killed by the attacks, he received a multi-billion dollar settlement from an insurance policy taken out just a few weeks before. This policy was set up specifically to ensure the buildings against destruction via a terrorist attack. This was particularly fortunate, considering the fact that Silverstein was having difficulty in finding new tenants to occupy the buildings at the Trade Center. And it was also particularly fortunate, considering that Silverstein had faced the $1 billion requirement of having to remove the illegal asbestos from every steel beam in the Twin Towers. So, if Larry Silverstein's story is true, then he must surely be the luckiest man alive today. Larry Silverstein, last time we talked, sir, I asked you if you could address some of the 9-11 conspiracy theories that you are accused of. Uh, sadly, your response has actually invited more of them. I mean, for the record, everybody knows your infamous comments on PBS where you said pull Building 7 uh, on 525 on the day of 9-11. Your official response was that it was the firefighters. My question is, 
it was pretty clear that you met the building. And if it was the firefighters, they already are outside the building by 12 because the water lines were broken. Ask the question. And the, the fire chief that you said you spoke to, Fire Chief Negro, denies talking to you on that day of 9-11. Can you answer those questions and address the theories against you? I suggest to everybody's consideration Just one question. that we all look at the thousands of pages of testimony that have been rendered in the many years since 9-11. And let's use today's session for some of this. Are you aware of testimony of bombs in the building before the building collapsed, sir? Are you aware of that testimony? Sir, there's testimony by Barry Jennings. You sir, you don't have to touch me. Uh, listen, I'll, I'll walk away. All I'm asking is a question. I don't have to, don't have to be kicked out. It's a legitimate question. You don't have to put your hands on me. But all I'm saying is, no, I'm not. I'm here asking. The question was not answered. That's why I have a grievance. Larry Silverstein was told not to come into work. That's why him, his daughter, and his son never showed up to work on not 11. He, he put an insurance policy on the buildings. Reporters, do your job, please. Ask some questions. Ask some questions. Ask some questions. Ask some questions. I'm Leanne McAdoo with Infowars.com, reporting here from Times Square. I am standing next to Rudy Dent. He's a 32-year veteran of the New York City Fire Department. He's worked as well with the New York City Police Department. And you retired right after 9-11. He was there on 9-11. He saw World Trade Center Tower 7 come down. Rudy, tell us about what happened that day. Well, I was off that day, and I, got a, I received a call at home, and uh, I got to see both buildings come down on TV. I jumped on my motorcycle. I did about 120 miles an hour across the Tappan Zee. I reported to my firehouse, and then I uh, got my gear. Uh, a bunch of us got together. We commandeered a, a mail truck, and we made our way down to the to the site. Uh, at that time, well, uh, Building 7 was still up. Uh, I saw Building 7 come down. Uh, my fellow firefighters who were there, they did that involuntary jerk when a loud explosion goes off, you know, you, you can't help it, and they did. Uh, I'm a, a Vietnam veteran too, so I kind of didn't jump like they did, but uh, it was, there was an explosion. The building did come down in complete classical uh, controlled demolition. It came down on its own footprint. There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Gage from Architects and Engineers has completely handled that from his area of expertise. Okay. Now we heard uh, rumblings, things that the fire department was saying that they were overhearing Larry Silverstein talking about, uh, talking to his insurance company of whether or not he should have the building pulled. Um, in your professional opinion, was the building pulled? Well, let me say this. In the New York City Fire Department, I, as I said, I had 32 years there. I was a chauffeur and I was also a trained fire marshal. A fire marshal is considered an expert witness in court. He's like a, a forensic detective. He has the power to administer the oath, take testimony, and issue a subpoena. That's a lot of power. And he's, he's a highly trained investigative uh, 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 person in his area of expertise in arson and we have no term that i know of that says pulling buildings that's not our area of expertise we've never done that we don't do that so for him to say that i don't know where he pulled that out of but it, it it's just not part of our uh, operations okay right so the fire department doesn't have the training to pull a building, to demo a building like right. that. We're not trained to do that. We've never done that in my 32 years. I know of no evolution whatsoever that does that. Mm -hmm. And then talk to the, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. There is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. And there is no question that once he acquires it, history shifts immediately. Another development on Saturday. New York officials revealed at a news conference here in the city that a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. No other details were given, but the discovery prompted the FBI and police to expand their, the search area down in lower Manhattan.
some evil is just it can't be explained. Are, the, are these people happy? Are they are they joyous no. now? Are they celebrating? Oh, absolutely, they're Thank celebrating. God. There's one report. I, this has not been confirmed, but there's several that I have reports that there was a, a, a cell, one of these cells, across the Hudson River, and they got on the. This is the report. I emphasize. I don't know this for a fact, but there's several witnesses who say this happened. They got on the roof of the building to look across. They knew what was going to happen. Yeah. They were waiting for it to happen, and when it happened, they celebrated. They they jump for joy. In the days after 9-11, while Ground Zero continued to smolder, millions heard Dan Rather and various media outlets repeat vague and unconfirmed reports of arrests that took place that day. These rumors held that Middle Eastern men, presumably Arabs, were arrested in explosive-packed vans in various places around the city on September 11th, and that some had even been photographing and celebrating those events. What most do not realize is that those reports were not mere rumors, and we now have thousands of pages of FBI, CIA, and DOJ reports documenting those arrests. My binoculars, and I could see the towers from my window, and this is where I, you know, I'm looking, and all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park, and I see three guys on top of the van, and I could see that they were like happy, you know, they 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 were they didn't look shocked to me, you know, they didn't look shocked. The men were spotted shortly after 8:46 a.m. Yet somehow, at this early stage. Just minutes after the first plane strike on the World Trade Center, they were already positioned in a parking lot in Liberty State Park, taking pictures of the towers and celebrating. They left the scene shortly after being spotted, and at 3.31 p.m., the FBI issued an all-points bulletin advising officers in the greater New York area to be on the lookout for a white 2000 Chevrolet van with urban moving system sign on back. At 3.56 p.m., The van was spotted traveling eastward on State Route 3 in New Jersey and pulled over by Officer Scott DiCarlo and Sergeant Dennis Rivelli of the East Rutherford Police Department. Inside, they found five men. Sivan Kurzberg and his brother Paul, Yaron Schmel, Odette Elner, and Omar Marmari. A major terrorist manhunt began, and just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by patrolman Scott DiCarlo. We were asked to detain the van and the passengers. They were just removed from the vehicle, patted down for safety precaution, and, uh, you know, detained. 911 call at 410 Park. I think once the uh, FBI arrived, one of them stated that they were on our side. There's something to that effect. According to the police report of the incident, Sivan Kurzberg told Officer DiCarlo, We are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Their official story, they were just Israeli tourists working for a moving company who had heard about the first World Trade Center strike and rushed to get a better view of the events. They told interrogators they were working for Urban Moving, a shipping and storage firm run by an Israeli businessman who often employed Israeli students without work permits. The men say there was an innocent explanation for what was found in the van and their behavior on 9-11. They were, they say, simply on a working holiday. We heard in the news that one of the plane was uh, crashing down the building, and we thought it was an accident at the beginning. So we went up to the roof of Oba moving, and we saw the building burning. There is a better view from a building in Jersey that is up a hill straight line to the World Trade Center. We decided to go up there. It's like two, three minutes from the office. Stand over there and take some pictures. Everyone wants a picture like this in his camera. Although this narrative is still trotted out when the story of the dancing Israelis is raised in the media, it is an easily demonstrable lie. FBI reports confirm that the men were not taking somber pictures of a horrific event. When their 76 pictures were developed, they revealed the men had indeed been celebrating, smiling, hugging each other, and high-fiving. One of the pictures even featured Sivan Kurzberg holding a lighter up with the burning tower in the background. And these were no ordinary tourists. Oded Elner had $4,700 stuffed into his sock. They lied to the police about where they had been that morning. 
they were carrying plane tickets for immediate departure to different places around the globe. The FBI confirmed that two of the men had ties to Israeli intelligence and came to suspect that they had indeed been on a mission for the Mossad. And of course, after returning to Israel, Elner claimed on national Israeli TV that they had been sent there to document the event. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Their purpose was to document the event? But how could they possibly have known what event they were documenting at that point, before the second plane strike, when those few who even knew about the situation had assumed it to be an accident or pilot error? And when did they arrive at the parking lot to document the event anyway? The FBI reports show how the men gave confused and often conflicting accounts of when and how they learned about what was happening and when they arrived at the parking lot. Oded Elner even said they had arrived there shortly after 8 a.m., which would have been 45 minutes before the attacks even began. This is in line with one of the eyewitnesses that had placed their urban moving systems van at the parking lot at 8 a.m., how could they have been in place and ready to document the event unless they knew what was about to happen? Any way you cut it, this story is unbelievable. Men with documented connections to Israeli intelligence and working in the United States without appropriate permits were detained after having been caught celebrating the attack on the World Trade Center at a time when no one knew that the WTC strike was an attack. So surely these men are locked behind bars to this day, right? Surely they were transferred to Guantanamo and held without trial for 15 years as part of the war on terror, weren't they? No. They were immediately transferred to federal custody, held for 71 days, and then deported back to Israel. The owner of the Urban Moving Systems Company that had employed them, Dominic Souter, was investigated by the FBI too. They concluded that Urban Moving may have been providing cover for an Israeli intelligence operation, and even seized records and computer systems from the company's offices. When they went back to question him again on September 14th, he had fled back to Israel. And what about the dancing Israelis' pictures themselves? The Justice Department destroyed their copies on January 27th, 2014. And these intelligence agents on an intelligence mission who were there to document the event of 9-11 before anyone knew 9-11 was taking place? Don't worry, they were just spying on Arab terrorists. And while the FBI or certain sources might believe that in fact they were Israeli intelligence, they don't believe that the U.S. was a target, that they were actually investigating Muslim groups? They believe if this was an intelligence operation by Israel, that it was focused on the Islamic groups uh, and charities that raise money for groups that are considered by uh, U.S. law enforcement and others terrorist groups. And you'll note that after September 11th, the U.S. moved on many of these groups with indictments, arrests, raids on their headquarters, something that hadn't happened prior to this. These are groups that Israel believes have been funding Hamas and other terrorist organizations? Groups that are responsible for most of the suicide bombings there. But this story is not merely preposterous on its face. Even the implications of this story are themselves preposterous. If indeed the official story is a ridiculous lie then are we to believe that these crack Israeli Mossad operatives who were presumably aware of the attack that was about to take place had been sent to photograph the burning tower from a parking lot across the Hudson River? And that these specially trained intelligence professionals on their super secret mission were celebrating, high-fiving, and going out of their way to be noticed in performance of their task? This is equally preposterous. The only other possible conclusion is that these men were serving merely as a distraction. That they were not there to photograph for Israeli intelligence one of the most heavily photographed scenes in the world on that morning, but instead to be noticed and arrested as a way to divert attention from a much bigger and more sinister story. So if they were meant to distract from a bigger story, what story could that possibly be? It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. 
At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now, Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S., who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. There is no indication that the Israelis were involved in the 9-11 attacks, but investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins, but when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. Beyond the 60 apprehended or detained and many deported since September 11th, another group of 140 Israeli individuals have been arrested and detained in this year in what government documents describe as, quote, an organized intelligence gathering operation designed to, quote, penetrate government facilities. Most of those individuals said they had served in the Israeli military, which is compulsory there, but they also had, most of them, intelligence expertise and either worked for Amdocs or other companies in Israel that specialize in wiretapping. Earlier this week, the Israeli embassy here in Washington denied any spying against or in the United States. Carl, what about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected, none of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. The most phenomenal part of this report is not that it was eventually erased from the web by Fox News itself, but that it ever made it to the air at all. In December of 2001, Fox News investigative reporter Carl Cameron filed an explosive four-part series that went in-depth into an Israeli art student spying ring that had been under investigation before 9-11, extensive Israeli wiretapping of sensitive U.S. government communications, and the 60 Israeli spies that were detained in the wake of the September 11th attacks. Unsurprisingly, the story was quickly dropped, and no mainstream journalists dared to continue probing into the matter. This is the real story of Israeli spies in 9-11. Not some vague rumors about some dancing Israelis, but an FBI dragnet that swept up the largest foreign spying ring ever caught red-handed on American soil. And although the FBI were convinced that these spies knew about 9-11 in advance, their investigations were stifled and the issue was swept under the rug. Rather than making Israel enemy number one in the war on terror, Israel remains to this day the U.S.'s most important ally. And if I'm fortunate enough to be elected president, the United States will reaffirm we have a strong and enduring national interest in Israel's security. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated and they were perpetrated by the Islamic fundamentalists. Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100%. But perhaps this is understandable. After all, we all remember how Yasser Arafat gloated about 9-11 and said it was good for Palestinians, right? Oh wait, that wasn't Yasser Arafat. It was Benjamin Netanyahu. 
The Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv has reported Israel's former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, we're benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. And frankly, a strong prime minister is a strong Israel. And you truly have a great prime minister. In Benjamin Netanyahu, there's nobody like him. He's a winner. He's highly respected. He's highly thought of by all. And people really do have great, great respect for what's happened in Israel. So vote for Benjamin. Terrific guy. Terrific leader. Great for Israel. Given that the ultimate consequence of 9-11 was the beginning of a now 15-year-long struggle to transform the Middle East, a struggle that the neocons that went on to populate the Bush administration had been openly advocating since the clean break policy paper in the mid-1990s, it isn't hard to see how the September 11th attacks were indeed a boon for Israel. But information linking Israeli spies to advanced knowledge of 9-11 remains classified information. In a world of true justice, the dancing Israelis and other Israeli spies with insider advanced knowledge of the 9-11 attacks, who openly celebrated those attacks, would be the targets of the war on terror, not its beneficiaries. Some evil is just, it can't be explained. Are, the, are these people happy? Are they, are they joyous no. now? Are they celebrating? Oh, absolutely. Thank They're celebrating. God. There's one report. I, this has not been confirmed, but there's... I'm actually, I actually figure very largely in a number of the key conspiracy theories. September 11th, September 11th. Terrorists are terrorism. September 11th. Citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, Coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. Pentagon. The day before 911, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war, not on foreign terrorists. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. He said money wasted by the military poses a serious threat. In fact, it could be said that it's a matter of life and death. Rumsfeld promised change, but the next day, the world changed. Oh my goodness, we're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. It would appear that there has been another major explosion, this one in the nation's capital, you are looking at a scene of uh, apparent blast aftermath. There is smoke in the air over the Pentagon. We don't know whether this is the result of a bomb. The idea is to try to help change the Middle East. Now look, I did, part of the reason we went into Iraq uh, was, uh, the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. You talked about how you just sick you felt yeah. to your stomach when you found out there were no weapons of mass destruction. Can you bring me to that moment? Did someone walk in and say, we've stopped looking, they're not no, there? No, no. How did that happen? It just kind of was, a, it, it evolved. The fact that there wasn't weapons evolved. I mean, I was... You know, when we first got in there and started looking around and didn't find anything, it's, you get that kind of sinking feeling that... Uh, it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives, we don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Obviously it was a mistake. So George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. But so you there is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. And there is no question that once he acquires it, history shifts immediately. Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, 
we're benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. End quote. Netanyahu, Netanyahu then reportedly said these events, quote, swung American public opinion in our favor. International calls are mounting on Israel to show restraint and stop shelling civilians in Gaza, but the country apparently isn't ready for peace just yet, saying there's more to come in Operation Protective Edge. More than 90 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have been killed and hundreds injured in the offensive so far. At least 20 of those who lost their lives are children. Israel says it hit more than 100 targets in Gaza on Thursday. Many of the missiles have landed in residential areas, causing panic to ripple through the population. Journalist Harry Fear met those caught up in the violence as they brace themselves for yet more air raids. On a visit to Gaza's main hospital, we met four-year-old Shema al Masri. She was injured in her abdomen. She became collateral damage in a drone strike. The girl went to visit her sister with her parents. On the road, they came under missile fire. When she tried to avoid one, she was hit by a second. Her mother and brother were killed. She and her sister were left in a critical condition. Her sister died today, and the girl is still under God's care. No one knows if she's going to make it. Doctors tell me they've been dealing with a biting shortage of medical supplies in Gaza for the last three weeks as a result of the ongoing siege. But even civilians that survive the violence suffer the mental effects of living in a war zone. Abed lives in a neighborhood of Sheikh Radwan that was targeted last night. We were sitting by the entrance when the first missile hit the house and the second one soon followed. We carried the sleeping children out and ran away. The children began screaming through fear. In Gaza, dozens of Palestinians have been killed. In Israel, no one has been killed. As in recent years, this Hamas-Israel war is far from symmetrical in terms of casualties and civilian loss. It's been a traumatizing couple of days for the civilians of Khan Yunus in the south of the Gaza Strip, too. During its operation, Israel says that it's going after Hamas militants, those that it alleges are Hamas militants. However, it's willing to go as far as targeting their homes. And in this case, Israel killed six children and two adults when it struck this family home. The family didn't have time to heed the warning drone missile, which arrived four minutes before the main strike.
We were shocked when a missile hit my brother's house. After we hurried out, our house was hit too. By the house was a children's playground where most of the hits came. Israel has made clear that it's not interested in restraining its operation on Gaza so long as Hamas rocket fire continues. It's a recipe for further conflict and inevitable suffering for Gaza's civilian population. A population already so beleaguered now lives in fear of even more violence in the coming days. Harry Fear, RT, Gaza.